The XB-870 Valkyrie looks like it had been plugged from the pages of a science fiction comic book in the late 1950s. It was to become the world's biggest, fastest, and highest flying bomber in history with a sharp, angular design, six afterburning engines, and the most advanced targeting, navigation, and electronic warfare equipment America could summon until it wasn't. Whoa, did we boast too much? Was any of it true? Well, let's find out in today's video. Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. Before we get into the video, kindly note that the information provided in this video is for educational purposes only. Without further ado, let's dive in. The Valkyrie stands as a reminder, if not the culmination of the Cold War aviation ideology, of bypassing defenses with ever higher and faster platforms today. The XB-70, like America's famous SR-71 Blackbird and his defunct interceptor sister, the YF-12, tried to deliver on both in true American style by squandering budgets like jet fuel. The Valkyrie, which was born on the cusp of the missile age, could have become America's primary nuclear deterrent if the technology to create it had been available just 10 years earlier. But neither man nor machine can escape the passage of time, and the Valkyrie was no exception. Thanks to significant advances in the physics around supersonic flight, the program that would have eventually develop the Air Force B-70 supersonic bomber, which began in the mid-1950s. The XB-70 was designed to replace the brand new, at the time, B-52 Stratofortress, which, despite its amazing range and payload capabilities, was already susceptible to Soviet intercept fighters by the time it went into service in 1955. The XB-70 is now just one of several bombers that have failed to dethrone America's mighty buff, a list that will soon include the retiring B-2 Spirit and B-1B Lancer. Intercept fighters and anti-aircraft artillery were the chief risk a bomber faced on a flight at the time both of which could be avoided by simplifying higher than they can reach and quicker than they can shoot. While simply, in theory, this technique presented great engineering problems that resulted in some of the most unique, dynamic, and capable airplanes ever to fly. The XB's first designs were based on the brute force idea, which called for carrying a tremendous quantity of fuel for a long duration subsonic flight in Soviet territory and an aerodynamic design tuned for a great performance during a relatively short sprint into enemy airspace. This method resulted in colossal designs based on external fuel tanks that could be discarded once they were drained. Although these tip tanks were disposable, they were neither small nor inexpensive. Each 191,000 pound tip tank was almost the same size as America's existing B-47 Stratojet long-range bomber, according to the 1960 Congressional Report. When the gigantic 750,000 pound bomber was brought to the famed Air Force Commander Curtis LeMay, the man behind America's B-29 bombing assaults in World War II's Pacific Theater, he dismissed it outright. North America responded with a plan for a bomber built from the ground up to fly most of its missions at Mach 3 and 70,000 feet, though some sources claim 80,000. Their XB-70 was designed to ride on the shockwave it produced at supersonic speeds, with a delta wing, slab-sided fuselage, and a massive triangular intake on its belly positioned well forward of the bomber's engines in order to achieve and maintain these high speeds. North American designers were able to strategically place the high pressure caused by the shockwave on the bottom side of the wings because of this angled intake. In other words, the XB-70 would ride a shockwave created by itself at Mach 3. Despite its futuristic appearance, the new XB-70 Valkyrie was not dissimilar in size to the B-52 it was supposed to replace, at least when compared to the 750,000 pound monstrosity that had been envisioned. It was longer and narrower than the B-52, with a wingspan of just 105 feet compared to the B-52's 185. It was touted as flexible to suit special electronic countermeasure suites or reconnaissance pods, which allowed the high-speed bomber to serve in non-kinetic duties with a nearly 30-foot-long bomb bay-wide enough to handle any nuclear or conventional bombs in Uncle Sam's inventory. Six General Electric YJ-93 GE-3 afterburning turbojet engines powered the bomber, each rated at 30,000 pounds of thrust with its afterburners activated, though the engines actually generated closer to 29,000. Even if they were oversold, that translates to nearly three times the thrust of the brand new at the time B-58 Hustler, the world's first operational Mach 2 bomber. Despite being 30 years earlier, these engines were lined up on the center line of the aircraft's bottom, giving it a tail's perspective that now looks identical to an Imperial Star Destroyer from the Star Wars franchise. A four-man crew, consisting of a pilot and aircraft commander, co-pilot, bomb and navigation officer, and defensive systems officer, flew the XB-70. Surprisingly, each crew member was given an encapsulated ejection seat, 
that encircled them and provide compressed oxygen during the descent from 70,000 feet. This concept was not new, as a comparable ejection capsule had already been designed for the B-58. If the NK seat fell into the water, it functioned as a boat, complete with a radio and fishing gear. The plane would also include 45,000 pounds of survival gear for each crew member, including cold weather apparel, a hunting rifle, and a week's worth of supplies according to documents, though it's unclear whether this was placed in the ejection seat capsule or not. This device allowed the pilot to stay in a sealed capsule within the aircraft while the rest of the crew ejected, letting him guarantee the crippled bomber didn't crash in an inhabited regions or close to American forces before ejecting himself. The fuselage, as well as majority of the aircraft's external surfaces, were built utilizing a stainless steel honeycomb style sandwich technique to construction which provide a high level of strength while remaining light. High strength titanium alloys were employed wherever possible to reduce the bomber's weight. All elements used in the Valkyrie's construction were chosen expressly for their capacity to withstand the extreme heat of flying at Mach 3, while exceeding what was once described as the thermal barrier for aircraft with aluminum fuselages. As a result, aluminum-based aircraft, such as those used by the Soviet Union, could not be updated to bridge the speed deficit, and new platforms would have to be constructed entirely. The Valkyrie's wide delta wing was completed with forwarding canards, which supplied lift ahead of the aircraft's center of gravity and allowed for superior trim control and trim drag reduction at high supersonic speeds. The canards themselves had flaps, which combined with the use of the aircraft's elevons as flaps and the wide delta wing allowed for slower takeoff and landing speeds that would otherwise be possible. According to the press release, auxiliary power for the Valkyrie's onboard subsystems is exceptionally light and efficient and with the equivalent horsepower of the current V8 engine and one-third the volume of two-thirds the weight. The outer wing panels were hinged to allow for improved subsonic and supersonic flying due to the design's devotion to high speeds. During takeoff and low-speed flight, the panels would lie flat, thereby extending the wing surface and boosting the aircraft look-to-drag ratio. The wingtips of the Valkyrie would slant down once it reached its supersonic speeds, reducing the wing area behind the bomber's center of gravity, cutting trim drag and increasing directional stability at high speeds. Cabin pressurization was performed by utilizing the tremendous pressure of the air rushing into the intake during supersonic flight, with an engine-driven compressor assisting as needed to maintain a pleasant 80,000 feet above sea level interior. The pressurized cabin offered a t-shirt flight environment for the Air Force, which not only made long distance flight more pleasant, but also eliminated the need for special pressure suits like those worn by SR-71 and U-2 pilots. In the case of a nuclear war, skipping this time-consuming pseudo process would allow for speedier scrambling times. The Valkyrie used an IBM-developed bombing and navigation system that combined gyro-stabilizing inertial navigation with automatic star tracking to offer real-time information on time and distance to the target. Its defensive system operator would be capable of jamming radar frequencies as well as conventional operating countermeasures like flares and shaft, and a search radar system with such a high definition that its image was compared to taking a photograph. Theoretically, the XB-70 would give the requisite height and speed to beat Soviet defense, as well as the payload capacity to carry America's most powerful weaponry and the fuel economy to fly more than 6,000 miles without refueling. The Valkyrie would rule the roost in the age of speed and altitude. Unfortunately, for this forward-thinking design, the world was rapidly changing around it. With hypersonic flight becoming more of a focus for the US and near-peer competitors, it appears likely that we will witness a comeback of aircraft capable of flying at such dizzying speeds. If that's the case, we might see some of the XB-70's lessons applied to future bomber platforms. The Valkyrie, on the other hand, will always be another what-if stored away neatly in the Pentagon's bowels. Do let us know in the comment section below if you enjoyed this video, and please check out our other videos.